So science and revelation. Uh, what I want to talk about today is what is the issue and then what can we do in our high school theology classrooms to help relieve some of the tensions that come up. Um, Ed asked me to talk about this topic, but I want to start with a disclaimer. The disclaimer is this. I'm not a theologian and I'm also not a scientist. Okay, so uh, I almost uh, pursued a doctorate in philosophy and a, and a career in theology, so does that give me a little credibility, the almost? Um, no, I'm a, I'm a philosopher. Um, I want to tell you a little bit, uh, a, a little story about how I got into philosophy because it's, it's relevant for the faith and reason kind of a thing. So when I was an undergraduate at Franciscan University of Steubenville, right at the end of my undergrad study, so I was a senior, and Alice von Hildebrand, this philosopher, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Alice von Hildebrand, maybe her name's familiar. She was this 80-something-year-old woman, slight frame, very frail voice, and she came to give us a lecture there. And one thing she said at the end of her lecture just rocked my world, changed the whole trajectory of my life and my career. She said this, in order to open up the doors to God, we need to combat moral relativism. And I thought, wow, okay. So I just, I sat with that for a little while, went back to my room, and I thought, okay. Um, moral relativism could stand in for all sorts of errors in philosophical thinking. Um, if we have errors in our thinking, errors in our reasoning, then those might be some blocks to the life of faith. And I thought, wow. Well, I think I could do that. I think I could take on some of that down and dirty work of laying the foundation, kind of working against some of those philosophical errors so that people like you can open up the doors uh, wider to God for some of the students. So that's how I got into philosophy. Um, and what I offer you today is drawn from the philosophy classes that I teach at Borromeo Seminary, all those classes are John Carroll University classes. Um, in particular, uh, one class that I developed called, it's a long title, it's ridiculous, called What Does Science Prove? Topics at the Intersection of Science and Religion. Um, so that's what I'm bringing you today, not expertise as a scientist or a theologian. I depend on you for the, for the latter part of that. So um, <clears throat> I want to start with some, some general points. Uh, last year, Pew Research published a report, maybe you've heard about it, uh, from 2018, also 2016. Maybe you've heard about it ad nauseum. You're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe somebody's talking about this again. Um, but maybe you've never heard of it either. But I think it's good to keep bringing this up because it's important. Okay, so 39% of Americans in the 18 to 29 year category identify as nuns, N-O-N-E-S. That's a little older than the folks you're dealing with, but it's right in the group that I'm dealing with, uh, college age students. Now, the 2018 study and the 2016 study were asking questions about why some of these young people are identifying as nuns. What happened? Why did they no longer believe religion was true? And when they asked why they didn't believe, they said, well, you know, my beliefs in God have evolved. They report a crisis in faith. Now, some key reasons for this crisis of faith include, they report in this study, their words, not pews, intellectual skepticism and the blindness, shallowness of faith and religious belief, and then also what they say is the unreasonableness of faith. Okay, so Bishop Robert Barron, we've heard of him, right? He used to be at Mundelein Seminary in Chicago, now he's out in California. He gave an address to the First Things community. First Things is a Catholic magazine and online publication, and they have an annual lecture. I think it's called the Erasmus Lecture or something. So Bishop Barron gave this lecture last year talking about these very reasons. Why are young people leaving the church? Why are they giving up on the faith? Why do they have this impression that the faith is shallow? And there are a lot of reasons, but the bishop highlights one really important reason which is relevant for us today. And that reason is the comparatively shallow theology curriculum compared to, say, math and science. Now, I'm not pointing any fingers here. Bishop Barron wasn't pointing any fingers here, but it's good for us to remind ourselves about uh, 
a challenge um, to keep our theology curriculum deep. So I remember back in my high school days doing lots of coloring activities in my <laughs> theology classes, okay? Making comic strips based on the scripture texts, telling the story of David in a comic strip. Um, I remember in grade school doing lots of connect the dot pictures of Jesus and Mary and um, like every day, you, you know it. One, two, three. Yeah, exactly, like this is what we did. Whereas in high school I was studying calculus. I was uh, dealing with dangerous chemicals in the chem lab. Um, in grade school, I was learning fractions. I was learning all about the systems of the body at a really deep and complex level. And then we were coloring pictures in the theology classes. OK, so Bishop Barron is making the same point. And it's no wonder then why young people give up on religion in their teens. And I realize there are a lot of reasons for this, but this is one reason. Theology, religious claims, just don't live up to scrutiny in the way that perhaps the claims of um, science or um, mathematical theorems do. Why? Because they haven't been taught um, the theology at a deep and rich level. Okay? So students think, well, I don't need that stuff. It doesn't live up to rational scrutiny, so I'm going to set it aside. And then they might think that religious belief or faith is only for those people that are kind of dumb, kind of unreflective people. Okay, so even, even here, we already see a tension building between faith and reason. Reasonable people are not people of faith. Um, so what I want to do now, and I'm going to do this um, throughout. I don't want to just do a long period of Q&A at the end because it would be boring to listen to me talk for an hour and 15 minutes of Q&A. So I want to pause um, and have a discussion. So here's our friend Bishop Barron. And I want us to reflect together, so I don't know, raise your hand or just shout it out. Um, let's talk about this claim of his about theology light. Do you think he's right? Do you think that theology curricula is a little bit shallow? Or maybe you can reflect on your experiences in grade school or, or high school. What do you think? Yeah, Mike? I think um, a lot of our students have this mis misperception that science involves logic and reason in a step-by-step -step method methodological. Methodological. <laughs> methodological approach, right? But that theology is just like, I believe it because the book tells me to. Yeah. You know, and in reality, when I tell the kids, you know, who is the, uh, who, who created the Big Bang Theory? You know, it's a Catholic priest. Yeah. Who, who uh, is the modern day father of genetics? Yeah. You know, Catholic priest, like, that there is this deep, reasonable approach. And so I try to bring some philosophy and it will be time. Try to bring some into our classes as well. Just yeah. to say that it involves reason. Faith without reason can be like dangerous. Yeah. And so it needs to be reasonable. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Mm. Yeah, I, I won't name any names of the actual book we use, but. Uh, but everyone knows yeah. because it's the same book. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe. Hopefully. Okay. Um, but it, it's just interesting. Uh, gratefully, a new teacher and the rapport is pretty solid and very quickly. The, the complaint was this is pretty one-sided without any thinking. And that yeah. actually showed up in three consecutive days where students raised their hand and could rebuttal the book. And I said, wow. yeah, let's uh, break this open. Wow. Uh, I think that they're, in, they're right on what you're saying. So. OK. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Anybody else? Are, are the grade school students coming in prepared? Not, I'm just wondering. I mean, I receive students after some of you have already had them. Right, so I see something else, but I'm just wondering, what are, what are you getting with the 14-year-olds when they come in after eighth grade? What's going on with that? They know the stories, but that's it. They've made comic strips of them yes. and colored. It's okay. Okay, so they know. Okay, go ahead. I would say if they have been exposed to an Asian and the of the Good Shepherd, they are coming well prepared. Okay. They are in a Good Shepherd program. The knowledge that goes with the basic understanding of scripture and tradition is in yeah. it. And if there yeah. is an atrium at your school and it's used as a, not as a special, but as a, a theological class, it certainly makes a difference in their preparedness to receive the further and deeper knowledge. And it's not so light. Okay, so it depends. You're saying it depends yes. on where they're you coming from. There is no dot to dot. There is no book. It is all <laughs> hands-on integration 
and it's your relationship okay. with Jesus. Well, fantastic. So I think it just depends on what your school endorses. Right, where you're coming from. In the back. Um, so I, I actually taught junior hair religion for many years. Um, and I like we would always, have, well, I didn't after a while, but every class got these books called Christ Our Life by the way over class. Mm -hmm. Teachers just usually just go through chapter by chapter. But um, I would get the idea that, so most of the teachers say that taught junior high religion did not have much much background. They take the little course that the diocese says, but it's very simple. I mean, the stuff that's in that course is pretty much what I taught the junior high kids. So um, after a couple of years, I was I could figure out with like, this, you know, they're not emphasizing the important things. They're just going through each chapter. The kids learn what they need to know, take the test, and then forget it. So I think that was the problem. But I think it's also a problem that as the kids get older, you know, like you could just take this little bitty course at the diocese, and then they give you the book and you do it. So I. I think there was that kind of disconnect too. Okay. It really wasn't <coughs> wasn't coloring or anything. It's just so it could it could be a rich curriculum if it's supplemented right. by the right. teacher. If, yeah. yeah, if the teacher has background. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but Phil was saying, well, maybe there are parts of it in the text itself that's a little bit light. It could use a little. A little boost of rigor. Well, yeah, I think it's the problem that, you know, I, I don't know. I think all the diocesan schools use the um, Loyola tax. Yeah. You know, and I changed over. I got, like, St. Mary's. They do um, a catechism for middle schoolers, which is, I love St. Mary's Press, which is really, yeah. really good. And then they get the solid information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, I think there's a misconception among a lot of students that theology is going to be very easy. It's true. Yes. And so I, I'm teaching seniors for the first time this semester with my colleague Devin. And I'm finding that so many students are just thinking that every answer is going to come so easily and quickly. And they're just going to be able to, like, yeah. be ready right away without giving any thought. And right. so it's a struggle especially for the students who don't have a capacity to think deeper in a theological context because they just assume they're going to know it because they went to Catholic grade school, yada, yada, yada. Right. Um, and so it's like the outliers are the students who can really go deep and like think beyond and ask really hard questions and wrestle um, with it, um, which can sometimes be frustrating because it's hard to go as far as you could. Right. But we at least want it. We, we want to um, relieve this misconception that it's a blow-off class. Yeah, um, totally. Right, so if it's coloring, then it, yeah, it's going to be a blow-off class. Or let's just come together and share our feelings or something. There's an appropriate forum for that. But what you want to say is, no, like this is as rigorous as your, your anatomy and physiology class. Like let's, yeah. let's bump it up, right? Yeah. We can do this serious stuff. OK. so. Um, I want to move on here. That's a little bit of the backdrop, a lead up into the big science versus revelation, science versus religion debate. Now, um, I was actually just talking to Marcus, who's leading the other session. And he was telling me, sort of confirming a suspicion that I had, that at least here in America, there is this idea, misconception, I would say, that science and faith are not compatible. Students will tell you that you can't be both a scientist and a person of faith. You just can't wear both hats. It's one at a time. Okay? But here's the funny thing. If you ask them what science is, they'll say, I don't know. If you ask them what religion or revelation or theology is, they'll say, I don't know. Okay, they don't know what they're talking about with respect to science. They don't know what they're talking about with respect to revelation, religion, theology. But they know, at least, that these things don't go together. So. Um, one of the things that I do uh, in, sometimes in the seminary audience, although seminarians tend to have a little bit more of a balanced view um, coming in, but when I think that the audience is going to have this misconception, one thing I like to do is just crack open the door a little bit with a couple examples. Okay, this isn't going to solve the debate here, but what I try to do is just crack the door open. So um, Mike uh, already anticipated some of this. We know who this guy is, right? Oh, what am I saying? OK. That's easy. How about this guy? Yeah, OK. Father George Lemaitre, he was a Jesuit priest and the author of the 
The Big Bang Theory. Okay, so he was a mathematician, uh, physicist. He was a Belgian, and he had this idea, along with uh, sort of concurrently with Alexander Friedman, that there was this point called the cosmic singularity, this point of infinite density, this point of extreme heat, and then this moment where it suddenly began to expand very, very, very rapidly. The it meaning space-time itself, not stuff expanding into space, but space-time itself, which is really hard to wrap your mind around, like space expanding, but that's what happened, okay? So he had this idea, um, and He's on the record saying he doesn't think that science and religion have a fundamental conflict. Now, how was his view received in the church? How was it received in sort of a Catholic culture, the Catholic milieu? Well, Father Lemaitre was appointed head of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And in 1950, 1951, Pope Pius XII basically uh, praised him up and down for this theory, almost so much that Father Lemaitre was like, okay, hang on, you know, I'm not trying to prove Catholic teaching here that the universe had a beginning, um, but yeah, there's consonance here between science and theology. Now, how was Father Lemaitre's view received in an atheistic culture, where you might think, well, that's where science thrives, like the Soviet Union? Anybody know? Any guesses how it was received? Yay or nay? Yeah. I guess it would be rejected. Well, of the author, right. Of exactly. So um, in the Soviet Union, the Big Bang Theory was rejected on the grounds of clericalism. Okay? So there was a fear that it was, one, authored by a Catholic priest, and two, that the Big Bang Theory was too much like the Genesis story. Oh, and by the way, the Big Bang Theory didn't agree with Stalinist cosmology, which said that the universe was eternal and infinite. Okay, so what happened? The Big Bang Theory was banned for 30 years in the Soviet Union. So which is a better home for science, a Catholic, Catholic milieu or an atheistic one? Take another example. Uh, I don't have a slide for this one, but the Augustinian... Friar Gregor Mendel gave us the laws of heredity, uh, hereditary laws uh, based on some of his pea plant experiments. Now, also a priest. His genetic theory, accepted in the Soviet Union? No, okay. Proponents of Mendel's theory were declared enemies of the state, and they were sent to the gulags, you know, faded with imprisonment, near starvation, heavy work, maybe execution. If that wasn't their fate, then they disappeared. And we can take some guesses about what happened to them after, uh, after that. Um, his theory was banned. I'm not entirely sure why. Maybe because he was a priest. Who knows? Okay. Last example along these lines. Oh, by the way, this picture is of them together. Oh. <laughs> is that kind of cool? <laughs> okay. So here's a picture of our very own campus here, John Carroll University. Um, one important person in the history of John Carroll University is Father Frederick Odenbach. You heard of this guy? I think there's a plaque somewhere around here. What's that? Astrology. Not astrology. Astronomy. Not astronomy. Seismology. Seismology, which is a study of? Earthquakes. Earthquakes. Okay, so Father Odenbach, he was a physicist here, and what he noticed was all right, all over the country, we have these Jesuit institutions, high schools and universities. Now, they are uniquely positioned to collect data on the movement of the Earth's plate, so seismological data. And he thought, wouldn't it be good if we could collect all of that up and then learn something about what's going on in this area? So what he did was he bought 15 seismographs and set up shop at all those Jesuit institutions throughout the nation. That data that those schools collected was fed into a central location, which was John Carroll University. And then that data was sent on to an a international location in Germany. But uh, what's kind of neat is Father Odenbach, that kind of works, um, he lit, not only worked, but he lived in Griselli Tower here. Um, so that was the headquarters of the seismological stuff. Um, 
John Carroll is one of our claims to fame here. So I could go on with probably 100 examples here of Catholic scientists and mathematicians, men and women that have made huge contributions, but I'm not going to do that because um, I've put on your handout a couple of resources where you can go and um, read up on some of the biographies of, of Catholic scientists and mathematicians who've made huge contributions um, over the years. The real point here is, though, despite what I've shown just in those three examples, the conception that faith and science just don't go together still persists. Okay? This isn't going to relieve that problem. This problem, though, is our responsibility to correct or to begin to correct. Maybe put another way, um, it's this. Church tells us that faith and reason are harmonious in lots of documents, among them fides et ratio. So here's something from number 34. The unity of truth is a fundamental premise of human reasoning, meaning there's just one truth. You're not going to have a truth in mathematics that contradicts a truth in philosophy that contradicts a truth in theology. It's not going to happen. Why? Because of the principle of non-contradiction. Revelation renders this unity certain, showing that the God of creation is also the God of salvation history. It is the one and the same God who establishes and guarantees the intelligibility and reasonableness of the natural order of things upon which scientists confidently depend and who reveals himself as the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so the God who was the first cause of all things, the creator of the universe, is also the God who died on the cross. Okay, well, that's all fine and good. Thank you very much, Pope John Paul II. We love this document. We love you. But this isn't good enough. Where's the evidence? So if I were a student or my students today are going to say, show me the evidence. Fine. You say faith and reason are compatible. There's just one truth. Truth is not going to contradict itself. But how? Show me the evidence. Show me why that's the truth. How do we do that? I think that's part of our job. How do we show this in concrete ways? So what I want to do next is discuss some general <coughs> points for relieving this tension between science and revelation before looking at a very specific case. Um, so a couple general points. First thing, when I get into the classroom to talk about this conflict between science and religion, one of the things that I like to start with is this history of the warfare model, the history of the conflict between science and religion. So actually, um, for many centuries in the church, there wasn't this pervasive belief that science and religion were in conflict. This is a kind of a new thing since the 1800s. Okay? So a couple of American intellectuals, uh, William Draper and Andrew Dixon White, who had a chip on their shoulders about Christianity, in particular dogmatic religions like the Catholic Church. And what did they do? They each authored a book, kind of coined this term, warfare model, and then propagated these texts, lectured on what became the myth, or I'll call it a myth, of the conflict between science and religion. So I like to tell that story to the students and, and have them come to see that this is a relatively new thing. Now, what did they do? They cherry-picked quotations. They took scripture passages out of context, fabricated quotations altogether. I mean, that's not good scholarship. But still, you can buy their books on Amazon. That's the way it is. Um, so that's one thing I like to talk to the students about. And then, um, first couple years I taught the class, I didn't... Uh, let's talk about Galileo, but it came up every single time. So the, the sad case of Galileo, you know, put under house arrest for his um, scientific hypotheses. And so I don't, don't want to get into all the details of the case. It's a complicated one. And that's what I tell the students uh, in more detail, usually a whole class on this. Who was at fault? Both Galileo and the Pope at the time in this complicated case. For resources to find out more information on the warfare model and the Galileo case, I recommend to you, and it's on the sheet, um, Lawrence Principe's uh, uh, audio series. I think it comes in DVD. It's called Science and Religion. It's from The Great Courses. Um, you might even be able to download the podcast. There is a fee for it, but I really think he, he does a great job in talking about those two subject matters and more. So I'll just leave it at that. 
What I want to spend a little bit more time on is something that is more in the realm of philosophy. And this is another problem that we face, a general problem. Methodological naturalism. This is something that entrenches the incompatibility or this perception of incompatibility between science and religion. It's a fancy term, but don't be scared off by that. It's actually a pretty simple concept. For example, um, there's a widespread assumption that the mind and the brain are exactly the same thing, or the mind is reducible to the brain. This is part and parcel of methodological naturalism. It would be inconceivable to think that the mind could be something immaterial. Okay? So there's an assumption, a couple of assumptions that go along with methodological naturalism. So what is it? It is a predetermined framework for doing scientific research that ex excludes, in principle, anything that is non-physical. Anything that is immaterial is off the table immediately. The framework doesn't admit of it. So there are two assumptions, then, that go along with methodological naturalism. First, there's an assumption that the only real things are physical things, material things, stuff you can you know, touch. There's a second assumption that the only way to know about the world is empirically. That is, through methods that are testable and data that's available to us by means of our five senses. So what does this mean? Right out of the gate, stuff like God, the mind, an immaterial soul, angels, divine intervention in the world, like miracles, that's not real. That's not part of the system. Why? Because we've assumed that stuff doesn't exist because it's not physical. This is the framework that's implicit today um, in science. Whether they're going to ad admit it or not, this is just what's implicit. So take an example. Um, Fatima apparitions. You know what I'm talking about here? Children had these visions of the Blessed Virgin Mary, received messages from her. How would a methodological naturalist explain the Fatima apparitions? Hallucination. Hallucination. OK, that's one, one answer. Another answer might be lying. I think those are probably the two main possibilities. The kids are lying or hallucination. Is it even open to the methodological naturalist to say, yeah, they, they actually saw the Blessed Virgin? No, that's not an option. So that's an assumption that's made right at the outset. That could not possibly be the case. And so on for all the other sorts of miracles, perhaps, that we can talk about. So let's take a step back and, and discuss for a minute. How would, how would we respond to methodological naturalism? I can tell a nice story against the warfare model. I can give that history. I can t talk about the Galileo case. But how do we, how do we address this method, which is assumed, I think, from the students that I've encountered, particularly the high school students that I teach during the summer at the Tolly Lega camp, this is, this is the framework that they're working with. They don't know it, um, but the way they talk, I can tell that it is. So how, do we, how would you object to this? How would you address this? Phil? Ask of what, what they think their mind is. Do they have value? In it's my brain. <laughs> Well, I, don't, I don't know. Most kids kind of think that there's a, a semblance of a mystery beyond that okay. comprehension. I feel like there is a willingness to embrace that mystery. That's okay. The entering ground. Okay, so you, you push them a little bit yeah. back on the mind thing. I like that. Yeah, tell me your name. Uh, John. John. Perhaps, uh, I don't know, perhaps promote imagination. Uh, like ask them what they dreamt of the night before. What's in, what are your dreams? You're subconscious. Okay, so to kind of say, maybe there is something, an immaterial mind. You weren't actually experiencing those things. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a good approach. Mike, Mike. Your love you. Prove it. You, know, you can show examples, yeah. of it, but can you see that love itself? You know, and yet, it's one of the most real things. Wait, are you saying it's not just oxytocin in the brain? <laughs> <laughs> we can show chemical reactions. Yeah, we right? can. What your brain does when you encounter someone that you love. But is love more than that? Okay, yeah, that's great. Anthony. Um, appeal to the arts, uh, literature, film, yeah. music, um, poetry, things that 
that speak truth to their experience and who they are as people, but you can't touch or see or test. Okay, so appeal to other intangibles yeah, like that they may be willing and, to. And Beautiful. And courage and faith, love. Love, um, you know, prudence, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Chris? Um, I like the film. Students that, like, I can't prove it to you, but I can share my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you ignore my experience, <coughs> that's data out there that you're ignoring. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, if we get enough, they right. can't all be outliers. Right. Um, and people will say, well, that's the fallacy of majority or whatever that is, but it should give us pause to think, well, maybe there is something going on. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Tell me your name. Point out, oh, Paul. Paul. Point out, as Aquinas does, that, that physical science can't account for why material exists. Okay. So maybe, maybe that um, hits on another main kind of criticism you might have of this. So you say, well, what's the proof? What's the proof for this method? What's the proof for this framework? Can you can you offer me some? Yeah, look at Newton's laws of, of uh, you know why of, of you know the, how nothing is created or destroyed, no material is created or destroyed, but there's material. So nothing in the physical universe can do that. Some outside the physical universe. Okay, something who's who's that's that's bigger, that's greater to produce that kind of effect. Sure. Yes. Tell me your name. They do seem really intrigued by those near-death experiences and <laughs> yeah. like that movie Heaven is Heaven for Real or whatever it is. They do seem to kind of believe that, you know? It's interesting. Okay, so that might crack the door a little bit. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, um, another thing that I want to suggest to you uh, to, to push back a bit on the methodological naturalism here is that this framework is impervious to counter evidence. What do I mean? Um, oftentimes when we're trying to uh, disprove something, we give a counter example. So if I make this claim, all swans are white, and Chris comes up and says, no, I have a pet black swan. That's not true. Um, some swans are black. Oh, OK. That would be a counter example to, to disprove the claim that all swans are white. Now, this framework cannot admit of any counterexample, any spiritual non-material being as a counterexample. Why? What could possibly count as evidence? Nothing. Because non-physical things are immediately counted as non-real. Okay? And that seems to be problematic. We should be able to disprove a theory. It should be open to being challenged. And this one is not, uh, which is one reason why it's highly problematic. Okay. Any questions at this point? Question of the I don't know if it's a question or just another avenue to add where, you know, what are the ways of knowing? <clears throat> I think maybe that could be another you know, way to help expand their mind of saying, mm -hmm. is that the only way to know versus, you know, other methods of revelation, divine revelation, or even experience, know, personal encounter. Right, uh, you know, yeah. things that someone said, <laughs> certain personal experiences where this happened at you know, a particular funeral, or right before someone I knew and loved died, X, Y, and Z happened. Just a near death then, experience or something. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, or even before the death. Right? Yeah. Um, and all of that um, might be another way to kind of expand their mind to go beyond. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Go ahead. Um, which reminds me of what we discussed earlier in the previous session about certainty. Mm -hmm. That this is like certain. Like, we know this, that only physical things are real. Right, so the, the, the claim is to right. certitude, right? right. And as a person of faith, we have to admit that we, may, we might be wrong. Scientists also have to state that too. Right, there's a, a humility that's demanded, yeah. even in, in science, right? Okay, um, let's move right along then. So in, my, in the class that I teach, I have developed a method, a four-pronged method for presenting particular subject matters in which it seems that the claims of science conflict with theological claims. Now, some of the topics that we cover are things like uh, ev biological evolution versus historical Adam and Eve, um, developing technologies in artificial intelligence versus the theological claim that human beings are uniquely created in God's image and likeness, um, stuff about um, the natural world 
being purely material, purely physical, governed by the laws of nature, and therefore determined, and the theological claim that humans have free will and are sometimes blameworthy for the actions that they do. So in the class at the seminary, we, we talk about those issues, and we go about it in a um, pretty, I don't know, methodological way when we're taking on these points of tension. So the first thing, the first one in a fourfold method, just so you know where we're going, first thing I do is I give the scientific claim. Now this is really hard for me to do because I'm not a scientist. So some topics end up being pretty difficult for me to wrap my mind around. So a couple weeks ago in the class, we were talking about cosmology, looking at whether the universe had a beginning or didn't have a beginning. And I found myself you know, pretty much waist deep in some complex mathematical arguments and uh, arguments dealing with the possibility of actual infinites, which is all very interesting but, but hard because that's not my area. Um, so even though it's hard to do, what I try my very best to do, kind of like what um, was said in our previous presentation, give a most comprehensive and sympathetic view that I'm possibly able to do when I'm offering this scientific claim. What I absolutely don't want to do is give a straw man. A straw man, for us philosophers, is a material fallacy. We know what a scarecrow is, right? So if I go up to a scarecrow and I give it a kick, it's going to fall right over. Why? Because it's made of nothing, right? It's just stuff with hay. It's not going to stand up to criticism. So um, in our theology classes, in our philosophy classes, we give a straw man when we capture, say, our opponent's argument in such a simplistic way, an argument that they never really gave, such a simple one that it's easy for us to knock it over. That's what I don't want to do when I'm giving the scientific claim, is give a ridiculous version of it so it's easy for me to destroy. So kind of following the lead of St. Thomas Aquinas, you got to try to give the strongest possible uh, articulation of the claim, which can be hard to do, and it's hard to knock that one over. But we know we've really done it. We know we've really found, hopefully, consonants if we've addressed the most comprehensive scientific claim that we can. OK, so that's one thing I try to do. Next thing I try to do is remind the students that scientific conclusions change. So why are they changing? Well, because the data is still coming in. We're living in this material world the, you know, we're not done. So the data is coming in, and we're still trying to figure things out. We need to be open to revision and hold the present theories with a gentle grip. Right? Is, is Pluto a planet, or is it a dwarf planet, or is it not a planet at all? I, I don't actually know where we stand today on October 18th, 2019. That's why I'm saying hold it with a loose grip. Okay. Second, second part of this four-part method, give the theological claim. It's a little easier for me. You know, I'm a philosopher. I do have one degree in theology. But, you know, theology is a near neighbor um, to philosophy. So where do I go? I consult the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I consult documents issued by the Vatican, encyclicals, apostolic exhortations, and so on. Consult the scriptures. One issue that comes up, though, is exactly how to interpret the scriptures. So one thing we have to clarify in class is the distinction between the literal meaning of scripture and the literalistic or fundamentalist reading of scripture. So the literal meaning, what is it? I'm sure you all know it well. It gets at the mind of the, well, the human author not the divine author, gets at the mind of the human author. What did he mean by the text? So Pope St. Pius XII, I guess he's kind of our star today. I'm going to quote him a couple times, uh, but it's worth it. In Divino Aflante Spiritu talks about this. He talks about the literal meaning, and he says it's just not always easy to discern. So he writes, for what they wish, they meaning the human authors, wish to express is not to be determined by the rules of grammar and philology alone, 
nor solely by the context. The interpreter, that's us, as it were, uh, must go back wholly in spirit to these remote centuries of the East and with the aid of history, archaeology, ethnology, and other sciences, accurately determine what modes of writing, so to speak, the authors of that ancient period would be likely to use, and in fact, did use. Now, a similar point is made in a document we've already brought up today, Dei Verbum, some 22 years later. The text says, to search out the intention of the sacred writers, attention should be given, among other things, to literary forms. So that's something that we talk about in class. What, what are the literary forms? What was the author trying to convey? The church affirms the literal sense of scripture. We cannot dismiss that. The church is, says the scriptures are inerrant, even in the literal sense. Not the literalistic sense, though. The church does not affirm a literalistic, fundamentalist account, which really is just a matter of <coughs> semantics, semantic literalism possibly interpreting the scriptures out of context, a little passage out of the context of the pericope, out of the context of the, the book of scripture, out of the context of the Bible, out of the context of the living tradition, capital T, of the church. Okay, so what should we do? Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, should you pluck it out? Why aren't we all blind? Is there any one of us here who hasn't sinned with our eyes? Having uncharitable thoughts against someone, we see them, lustful thoughts, being jealous of our neighbor's stuff. How come we're not all blinded here? Why? Because what? Because <laughs> we understand implicitly, even if we couldn't articulate it, like literalism versus the literal sense, we all get it, right? Catholics the world over aren't blind. Okay, so we get this implicitly, and I do need to talk about that um, with my students. That's the first thing about the theological claim. A second thing is this. Despite the fact that we live in an age of unbelievable information access, this age is also unbelievably religiously illiterate. Okay, so we've got, you know, Google, just type something in really quick, you get an answer. We got Alexa or what is it, Google Home set up. We could just ask it a question, boom, tells us the answer. That's amazing. However, there's still religious illiteracy. Last Friday, I was listening to a talk by Holly Ordway. She's a J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, Lord of the Rings. She's an expert on that. And she was giving a talk on Tolkien and apologetics at the seminary. She made a really good point I want to share with you. So she said, we use words like God and prayer and evil and suffering and so forth all the time. But we, meaning like the broad culture, we don't really know what these words mean, despite the fact that we use them. Our students don't know what those words mean in a deep and rich kind of way. And sometimes when we use these words, we're actually talking past each other. So some of the new atheists, for example, Richard Dawkins, Hitchens, Dan Dennett, talk about God. They set up a straw man, like a God of the gaps argument, and then they knock it down. Are they talking about God in the same sense that we're talking about God in our classrooms or when we're at prayer? Probably not. So there's a great deal of talking past each other and a great deal of religious illiteracy. So one of the things that I have to do in class is give a true and, and rich, comprehensive definition or fleshing out of a theological concept to make sure that we're all on the same page in the classroom. Because what I also don't want to do is give a straw man to the theological claim, or offer a straw man for the theological claim. We don't want to do that either. So we got to uh, correct some of those misconceptions. Is this something that you teach in class, is literal versus literalistic yes. meaning? Yes. OK, that's an important thing that happens. OK, next thing. <coughs> we identify the tension or problem. Usually this is pretty obvious. OK. Fourth thing, this is hard, seeking consonants. Seeking consonants between the scientific claim and the theological claim to see if that consonance can be discovered. And I say consonance because 
That's all we're looking for here. Just consonants. Our faith isn't going to be justified by science. We shouldn't look for that. Um, after all, mainstream views in science, as I just said, they're, they're often changing. Why? Because new data is coming in. Furthermore, would it really be a matter of having faith if we say, yeah, I have faith in that teaching of the church because it's been confirmed, it's been proven by science. Is that really faith anymore? Well, well no, that's just a matter of knowledge. You have a right opinion about something because it's been cons confirmed by the data. Okay, so all we're looking for is consonants, not for faith to be justified by science. We don't want to hang our faith hats um, in the lab. Consonants, okay. So I found this method to be pretty helpful, pretty effective. There are some challenges with it. The main challenge, or one of the main challenges for me, not only is understanding some of the scientific claims, but it's finding scientific resources. So I can navigate, say, the philosophy waters pretty well. I know which journals are reputable and which journals are junk. I can kind of do that with theology, too. I know what's junky and what's, what's good. I know what things are sort of on the controversial borderlines. But when it comes to science, I don't know where the junk science is published. I don't know what the good sources are. So I remember talking to a group of scientists and saying, how do you, how do you find that stuff? And one thing they recommended to me, and I put this on your handout, is said, go to the AAAS website, A-A-A-S. Stands for, I always get this wrong, American Association for the Advancement of Science. They've got a lot of resources on their website. They have a Twitter page where they you know, post things and link up with other scientists. And so um, that's what these folks told me to do. Use that as a resource. Follow them on Twitter. Um, and that's a great way to find non-junk science sources. OK. What kind of questions? do your students have at the intersection of science and religion? Like real particular questions. What comes up in your classrooms? What are they asking you about that's been challenging? Particular issues? Uh, problem of pain and suffering. OK. Um, what part of that is the science aspect that you're trying to get at? Um, well, actually, yeah, I guess that would be. That's a, a massive, massive problem. Problem, 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 pain. Do you approach it from a scientist? Like, look at what, what's going on in the brain? Mm -hmm. I think it's like T-fiber excitation is what <laughs> deals with pain, but. Back to the folks on the fallen world that we okay. know okay. about those Okay. OK, natural disasters. What other things are they asking about? Yeah. Uh, like my biology teacher said this about evolution. What do you think? OK, yeah, that's, that's a huge one that, one that comes up for us. So evolution. Evolution, historical Adam, good. What else? Are they not asking these questions? What other things are coming up? Yeah. Um, I, they ask a lot about uh, genetics, like the, the things that are occurring now with, um, you know, people cloning, you know, and yeah, you know, why is that wrong? OK, so you know, questions at the intersection, like bioethics. Especially when it's helping for, like, medical Yes. purposes and things like that that's that's something that's really on their mind and they don't understand you know why okay so yeah all kinds of genetic issues so looking at new um, CRISPR technologies that are maybe they're they're editing the genome and then um, and another point to that too is like a lot of us a lot of our children don't know what would be a critical resource like they're looking at the wikis and you know what is the fast? You know what is the fast and hot answer that they're going to get when they Google something? Right. And I will ask them, well, how much of what you read do you really check? Check? Like, are you really fact checking your work? Because yeah. a lot of things that I'm reading on the internet, I'm finding like spelling mistakes. I mean, I was an English teacher before, <laughs> I became a theology teacher. And I'm thinking that makes me question the validity. Like, it should make you it should send red flags for them. As right. Right, so there's a, an important lesson uh, for them is to learn how to navigate sources. So what counts as a, a reputable source? And it's not going to be Wikipedia or Reddit or even a blog page in the back. Uh, not that I'm a teacher, but being in a uh, 
high school class a few years ago, a lot of questions that came up were dealing with issues of bioethics, like yeah. abortion and euthanasia, and um, just a lot of where it intersects in science today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. More bioethics. I want to support the freshman we talked about the Genesis story. Mm -hmm. How do you get from Adam and Eve to all those people all of a sudden? That yeah. doesn't make sense. They go right. back to that question. Right. Back to understand that. That's a big issue. Yeah. yeah. Where do the people come from? Right. Very good. Mm -hmm. What exactly is a soul? And where does it live? And when does it? Where does it come from? And where does it go? Yeah. So we're kind of back to methodological naturalism, like. Could there be such a thing as a soul? Because it seems like it's immaterial. If it's immaterial, could it be in a place? Um, if it's not, then what is it? What's its function? Where does it come from? Is it directly created by God? Where is it going after? Anything else? Other questions that come up for you? Um, this isn't necessarily one that's in conflict with theology, but a lot about climate change and what's okay. happening with the world. And and then are they Looking asking from a scientific perspective? What is the church saying in yes. response? Yes. yes, before they know. And then when they can see that they coincide quite well together and look at the to see and sure. all the things that are there, it's very helpful. Right. But yeah. They're concerned with what the church is saying. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Other issues that are coming up? Okay. I want to look at just one of these. Obviously, we cover all many of these issues in class. Not so much the bioethics issues because we have another, another class for that um, at the seminary. But what I want to look at now is a tough one, the one that I think comes up the most. And two of you already mentioned this one, and that is this, historical Adam and Eve and biological evolution. Now, all I can do is really just outline how I go about this in class. So an application of that fourfold method. So we spend three or four class, 75 minute class periods on this, obviously in um, 15 minutes. Uh, and I do want to leave time for Q&A, so maybe 10 minutes. I'm not going to be able to, to dispel all worries about this. I don't even know if I've resolved it for myself, but um, we can at least take a stab at it. So what's the first step? Give the scientific claim. So here are the things that we could talk about. What is biological evolution? What are the mechanisms of evolution? We might talk about natural selection. We might talk about horizontal gene transfer. Then we can talk about evolution as a theory. Because sometimes I'll get one student that says, hold on. We don't have to accept evolution because it's just a theory. What, what do we want to say in response to that? It's just a theory. Is it just a theory? Why do you say no, Chris? Well, theories are more fleshed out than just, it's not a hypothesis. It's been tested, it's been. It's been tested, it's been confirmed, but we can say a couple things. Gravity is a theory. Should you begin to doubt gravity? Should you try walking off a building? No, you should not do that. That would be ridiculous, OK? So there are theories, and there are theories. <laughs> and here's one that's been uh, examined for a long time, tested, confirmed over and over again. It's still called a theory because science does not work in demonstrative proofs. You know in mathematics, you just kind of can move from one to the next. And what do you get in mathematics? Certitude. In, depending on what kind of argument you're giving in philosophy, you can get certitude at the end. Your conclusion can be certain. In science, that's not what we get. We work in probabilities. Now, when it comes to evolution, when it comes to gravity, we're looking at very, 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 very high probabilities of truth. So that objection is not a great one when they say, hey, it's just a theory, so we can dismiss it. No. But that's an invitation for me to talk about what do we mean by theory? What is science in the business of? Is it in the business of proving something with certitude? It is not. It is not. OK. What else do we talk about? Um, genetic diversity. So we talk about how um, science would suggest that there couldn't have been just two original humans. Back to Michelle's point. How do we get this massive diversity in humans from just two? Well, probably we can't. We're looking at between 1,000 and 10,000 original humans to get the kind of diversity that we need. OK, so that's one thing we do. Give the scientific claim. Second step. What's the second step? Theological claim. 
I look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, St. Thomas Aquinas, as well as our very favorite, Pope St. Pius XII. <laughs> he was very verbal, um, I guess, during his papacy. Um, we look at this, these tough passages from Humani Generis, because this is where the meat is. We find out what are the theological concerns or claims really about. So here's what he says. Teaching of the authority of the church does not forbid that discussions take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution, insofar as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from preexistent and living matter. For the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. Okay, so you're allowed to have a discussion about evolution. So far, so good. But souls are immediately created by God. Okay. Next. This is the kicker paragraph. The, uh, the faithful cannot embrace that opinion which maintains that either after Adam there existed on this earth true men who did not take their origin through natural generation from him as from the first parent of all, or that Adam represents a certain number of first parents. I put this in bold the next line because it's important. Now, it is in no way apparent how such an opinion can be reconciled with that which the sources of revealed truth and the documents of the teaching authority of the church propose with regard to original sin, which proceeds from a sin actually committed by an individual Adam and which through generation is passed on to all and is in everyone as his own. Okay, what's the heart of the Pope's worry here about evolution? What's the main thing he's concerned about? It's not evolution in itself, it's what? It's original sin, okay? And then the kind of the flip side of that, if Adam, the original Adam was the one who committed the sin, then we have Jesus as the new Adam. And so the follow-up concern is about this redemptive act of Christ, one for all. That's the heart of the issue. That's the heart of the theological uh, problem that could be uh, with respect to the to the theological or the scientific claim of biological evolution. So what do we do in class? We look at that. We try to tease out what the Pope's concern is really about. Then we set up the problem. What's at issue is pretty evident. So the best of scientific claims suggest that biological evolution uh, of humans is pretty certain. And then you've got this pesky little issue in Catholic theology about original sin and the redemptive act of Christ, okay? This is, this is where the tension arises. So the last thing that we do is we seek consonance. And like I said, I'm not sure that I have an objection-proof response here. This is, this is tough ground. Um, in class, I present a couple different solutions that are probably not compatible with each other. Um, but I want to share with you one of those solutions and give you two resources. The first resource on the sheet, um, a website called BioLogos. BioLogos collects articles and puts out videos from Christians who are also professional scientists, many of them academics. Um, the one caution um, is that many of them, many of the contributors are not Catholic, so they're, they're, they're Christian, which means they can, there's a little more play with how they interpret original sin, okay? Some of the ways that they play with the doctrine are not compatible with the way that um, the church has, has explained the doctrine to us. Original sin passes through generation, not a different way, okay? So I, I use that resource, and the second one, this is the, the solution I'm going to present to you now, um, it's based on a book by Father Nicanor Ostriaco, a Dominican of the Eastern Province. Uh, the book is called Thomistic Evolution, and that's also on the handout. Okay, so here's Father Nicanor's proposal in summary fashion. Let's see if I can get it right. So he says, long time ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, 100,000 to 300,000 years ago, there were these anatomical humans, so beings that walked the earth that looked just like us, stood upright, had all the same physical features. And at some point, perhaps to one of them or a couple of them in this group, a genetic mutation occurred. 
that allowed for that being or those beings to become language enabled, so capable of really complex thought and communication. Once that mutation occurred, the body was ready, the flesh, the matter was ready for God to endow that individual with a rational soul. We learn from the, from the document here, the souls are immediately created by God, so we gotta hold that part, okay? So God endowed them with a rational soul. And then what happened? This individual, or those individuals, sinned. I don't know how long they went without sinning, but they sinned. And then they lost all those special gifts, all those preternatural gifts. But they were living and dwelling and walking among all of those non-rational, but, human, but, hu but humans, essentially. So they were not language-enabled. They were not capable of complex thought, but they were walking around with these beings endowed with rational, immortal souls. And perhaps they interbred. Here's how we get some genetic diversity. Okay. So original sin was passed down through those uh, individuals that had the rational, immortal souls, but we still get the genetic diversity because of the, the interbreeding. So Father Nicanor, who, by the way, he's a geneticist uh, at Providence College. So he thinks, look, on this, on this view, we get what we need, we, we get the whole evolutionary story. We get all the genetic diversity that we need. And we save, original sin, we save the idea that each soul is created by God and um, we have no problem with Christ being the new Adam. Christ's redemptive act. There are a lot of holes in this view. There are a lot of objections that you could raise at this point. But this is the beginning of one solution to this issue. Some are not convinced Carrie's like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, at this point, so we've got like six minutes or so, um, what, what comes up for you? Other issues you wanna talk about? We could talk about this. Uh, we could talk about other things that you, um, that come up in class, issues that you wanna um, that you've had to address, maybe how you've addressed them, different activities that would be good uh, to share with the group. Um, maybe you want to talk about what could be added or changed in the bishop's curriculum with regard to science and religion. Um, whatever you want to talk about, I'm open to. Mike. I think it's regarding the bishop's curriculum, I don't need to record right now, so. <laughs> um, That's all right, he's a nice bishop. focus on skill-based learning, the better. You know, what skills are we teaching them as a theologian, yeah. as a person of faith? Because when we focus just on content, content is extremely important, so don't get me wrong. It becomes more of a, what's the answer? Give me the answer of what the church teaches, yeah. right? And they love their engineering classes, their science classes, because it's custom, because it's hands-on. Yeah. And you're doing the skills, or learning the skills that a scientist can use mm -hmm. in a chemistry class. You right. know? So how can we give them the skills of a theologian? Or just a person of faith, what does that look like? Okay. So I would appreciate it almost being more... What are those skills? <laughs> I'm asking you. <laughs> You're the expert. You're in the classroom. Like, what are they? I mean, I can think about dispositions, like virtues or something, but like, what are those? Is it like, like reading, writing, or what, what exactly, what would you want to teach them in a... Like, uh... How to interpret a text. Okay. In a yeah. theological way. Okay. You know, as far as scripture goes. How to, you know, have a conversation in a faith-based way, you know, and be able to relay that that content, that knowledge. Yeah, that's great. Skill-based learning. What else? Other things you want to talk about? Yes. Well, I can attest to the difficulty of talking about things like Adam and Eve and the creation story and um, evolution. Because that's what I do. I kind of juxtapose and we talk about both. Yeah. And at a previous school, not the one I'm at now, I did that. And a mother said that, actually contacted the principal of the school, very upset that I was doing that and talking about evolution in theology. And so the principal said, you should talk to this mother. So set up a meeting, she walked in, already the veins on her neck were <laughs> We sat down and she basically, 
I'm going to summarize, called me a heretic. And um, she could not see any, any reason for teaching evolution along with the creation story. Long story short, she pulled her daughter out and sent her to a different Catholic school um, without really understanding why I was talking about evolution yeah. in that context. Yeah, um, that's, I'm sorry that you had to go through that. So that's, it was a missed opportunity on her part to see that there could be a really beautiful consonance between the Genesis story and the best evidence we have for biological evolution. Um, it could have been, yeah, a rich experience for her, but too bad. Yeah, was the student uh, previously homeschooled? No, in okay. fact, she had no problem with what we were okay. talking about. Okay. No problem whatsoever. She was a huh. kid. Yeah. But it was the mom yeah. who just... Yeah, I, I only ask that. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I have no, plenty of friends that are, you know, home, choose to homeschool their children, and I think that's lovely. But um, a, a number of my students have shared with me, along with some of the homeschooling moms, that uh, some of the science curriculum in some of the homeschool <laughs> curricula that's available is actually... Um, anti-evolution, um, young earth creation kind of a thing, and just kind of really watered down on the science, straw man science. And we really don't want to be giving that to the, the children. What else? What are some activities that you do in class to address this, these topics? Yes? In Catholic social teaching, we use the circle of faith and action approach, awareness, analysis, and action. Mm -hmm. So how to approach certainly social justice issues with an analytical approach, okay. investigatory type of approach. Okay, so you think maybe you can use that model to teach this, this kind of stuff? Um, that isn't part of my current uh, responsibilities in terms okay. of Genesis, but in almost every textbook, I mean, my colleagues would agree, we the Genesis story is the first chapter of every textbook. Yeah. Right? So we have an opportunity to address it sure. over and over again. We, we review it almost every yeah. in every course every year. So it it, it is plays an essential role in the new curriculum. Which, well, I, I don't know if it's new anymore, but but we used to call the new curriculum. Okay. So certainly we have an opportunity to discuss okay. to discuss that. Is um, there? Um, so the kids are receptive and um, kind of to this idea of in, yeah. in, in including mm -hmm. evolution, um, but um, I agree that sometimes um, parents are not. Right. Yeah, I think the kids are hungry for, for these sorts of things. So, you know, if we go back to one of my initial slides, the nuns, why are they leaving the church? Because the theology curriculum is watered down or um, other bits that I've read from the Pew study suggest that many are leaving because they're, because of the science issues. So they say, well, wait a minute. You told me the Genesis story was true. What about the dinosaurs? <laughs> uh, was Adam naming the dinosaurs? That doesn't seem to match up with what I'm learning in the science class. And then the biology teacher is able to give a much richer, detailed, sophisticated account, and then we're back to um, something kind of simple. And so they're so hungry for, for more. I think they, they want these to go together, um, and so it's, it's great that we're, we're here and we're trying to make that happen for them. When you do the Genesis story, question, trying to line up um, and it kind of goes on a lot of some of Scott Adams teachings in terms of the days of creation yeah. and looking at it in a way, and we're going to try it this year with Aquinas' proofs um, and looking at, you know, in that building of creation mm -hmm. is, a, like, how is evolution still possible? Yeah. Like, plants and animals came. Dinosaurs can come. You know, sure. like, it's it's consonant in that like it's not precluding or even like big bang theory with every how everything started but again it's like I, it's not my comfort zone so right. i don't know everything there is so right about the big but, so i don't right. try to pretend right exactly and you don't have to so sometimes i'm in class i'm like i that's a great question i don't really know we're sort of at the limit of my knowledge and that's it's very humbling to do that but it's also really human to be able to say uh, i don't know and i think they can appreciate that just when you're and just that, that the terms are consistent. Like yeah. If we say something outside of time and space mm -hmm. had to begin everything, yeah. could God be that something outside of time yeah. and space? So like our definition of God can be 
similar so that at least they can see that even scientists acknowledge something outside sure. of, you know, those confines. And they might not call that God, but we do. Right. So I'm trying to get them to see that the language sometimes has to... Right, match up. Yeah. So we're using the same terms. Okay, it is noon now. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, you have my information on there. If, if anything comes up, you have questions. Thank you. Thank you.